Um, all right, uh, thank you very much. And uh, thank you for allowing me to give the talk remotely. I've had a number of canceled flights, so I'm sorry I couldn't be there uh, today. Uh, this talk is based mostly on a paper with Hong Lu that came out a few weeks ago on uh, algebraic ER equals EPR and what I'm going, what we're going to call uh, complexity transfer. So I'm going to begin with just a little bit of, uh, of motivation and explaining where we're going with the with this, why we're reformulating ER equals EPR algebraically. So there's this general law uh, in the field of the generalized different qubit field that entanglement builds space time. And you can find various statements to this effect in, uh, in, in many papers. This has been uh, studied in some sense to death, you could say. There's a very standard example that we like to quote, which is the, uh, the thermal field double before and after the, um, the phase transition, the Hawking page phase transition. So or below and above the Hawking page phase transition. So when we have enough uh, entanglement between these two, the two CFTs, in a thermal field double, the emergent geometry is a wormhole, so two connected entanglement wedges of CFT left and CFT right. And when we have an order one amount of entanglement between the two, we just have some entanglement and we have thermal ADS, these two CFTs are not geometrically connected in any way. And this, the general expectation that if you have enough entanglement, you're going to get this emergent uh, geometric, geometrically connected space time is uh, this is a, is a vague expectation? It's sort of phrased or uh, framed in vaguely as ER equals EPR, and roughly speaking, it expresses the idea that if you have an order one over G Newton amount of a Neumann entropy between two subsystems of a uh, of a bipartite state, then this builds classical space time between the two. And if you have an order one amount of a Neumann entropy, there's some sense in which this is a quantum wormhole. This is a very this is very vague. This is a, just some kind of a rough expectation, a rough notion that has been um, expressed in several different papers. So, what what I'm going to begin here, but as far as motivation, is that E equals EPR is in many sense a cornerstone of our understanding of space time emergence. You see a lot the 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 way that entanglement, entanglement structure, entanglement uh, quantification. Is a uh, is something that's in, intimately related to the emergence of space time, but really, ER equals EPR is just a slogan. If we don't have an independent definition of what we mean by a quantum worm, we say this is classically connected, this is quantum connected. We don't have any quantification, quant quantifiable definition of what is the difference between a quantum wormhole and a classical wormhole. This is not a quantitative proposal that we can really use beyond some kind of vague expectation. So one, one way of formalizing the classical part of it is as follows. So we're going to call this classic ER equals EPR. So this is, again, this is expressing the idea that entanglement builds space time. And the statement, this is one way of formalizing it. You may disagree with this way. I'm just going to use this as a straw man. If there's enough Bonneman entropy in the marginals of some bipartite state, so if rho R1 and rho R2 are the reduced states of psi on R1 and R2, and there's enough one element entropy, um, the one element entropy of rho R1 or of rho R2 is above some threshold, or the one of a G Newton is usually how we think about it. And each one of these has a semi-classical gravitational emergent bulk description. Then the dual to so the pure state of these two systems is, class is connected by a classical wormhole. So this is um, one way of formalizing or trying to make ER equals EPR a more quantitative statement without actually getting to the to talk about what we mean by a quantum wormhole yet. And as it turns out, without a further refinement of what we mean, what is the difference between a classical wormhole and a quantum wormhole, it turns out that this statement is actually false. And we are going, we gave, uh, so, so my student Osman Folkstad and I gave a counterexample to this statement in, um, in, in, in a very uh, well-studied situation, the evaporating black hole in ADS in 2022, so last year, um, early last year. And it turns out that if we want to make a statement that is robust and quantifiable and quantitative, then we need to talk about what we mean by classical wormhole and a quantum wormhole. So in this talk, I'm going to begin by first giving a review of this particular counterexample to the idea that entanglement builds space-time when you have an emergence in the classical space-time. So this is, uh, this is, again, based on this older paper. Then uh, I'm going to give an algebraic proposal 
using the von Neumann algebra and sort of the fine-grained structure of entanglement for what does build space-time connectivity. And this is based on a paper that came out a couple of weeks ago. And then there's going to be um, some discussion, hopefully if I have time, of an application of this proposal for understanding the emergence of certain subsystems in the bulk using a transfer of a high complexity algebra of operators. So we'll begin with a review of this counterexample, mostly because it sets the stage and also introduces a number of techniques that I'm going to be using throughout this talk. Okay, so the counterexample, as I mentioned before, is in the context of the evaporating ADS black hole. So just as a, a sort of a lightning review here of the salient points, we take an ADS black hole. Here, I'm taking a single-sided ADS black hole. You can accomplish this either by collapsing some matter in higher dimensions or in GT gravity, you can just put an end of the world brain, an unflavored end of the world brain uh, behind the horizon. So we couple this to a, uh, an auxiliary system, we usually takes it to be a CFT in the ground state, and we let it evolve. So at early times, so this, this can be times as, as late as the order one over G Newton, but before the page time, the entanglement wedge of, this, of the lower dimensional CFT, the one that's dual to, um, to this blue entanglement wedge here, called this capital B, that has a complete time slice of the bulk. So it's a complete Cauchy slice over here of the bulk. And after the page time, the entanglement wedge of the subsystem B does not contain a complete time slice, right? We this, this time slice over here, this Cauchy slice actually would have to continue into the island. So here we have an inextendable time slice of the entanglement wedge of capital B. And here the time slice of capital B is extendable. So this difference is going to be critical for the counterexample that we're going to construct. Okay, so now we, we'd use the fact that the page curve goes up and then comes back down. Start with the black hole form from collapse, pure state. Um, the page curve is gonna come up until it's page time and then it's gonna come back down. In particular, that means that we, we're gonna be talking about the von Neumann entropy of, of B here. So not of the radiation, but of the black hole. And we can pick two types, T1 and T2, so that the von Neumann entropy of capital B is the same, one before the page time and one after the page time. And now let's take a look at this, uh, what it looks like geometrically. So before the page time, again, capital B has a complete Cauchy slice, an inextendable slice of the bulk. In particular, what this means is that capital B cannot be gravitationally connected to anything because it contains a complete inextendable Cauchy slice. By contrast, after the page time, capital B does not contain a complete connected, a complete geometric Cauchy slice. It ends here. And in, in particular, it's classically connected to the entanglement wedge of the radiation. So here we have a situation where even though the binomial entropy of capital B is the same here and here, the full state on capital B, capital R, R is the radiation. Here, that full state has the same phenomenon entropy of the marginals here as well as here and here. But at the same time, this is connected to that after the page time and they're disconnected before the page time. And I, I wanna say gravitationally disconnected. Now, this example sometimes trips people up because there's this interface here between these two. And you could say, oh, well, they're not gravitationally connected, but they're still connected in some sense. So it's actually useful to construct a, an example that doesn't involve the bath at all and is, does not involve transparent boundary conditions. It's just very standard ADS CFT. So that's the example that uh, my student Osman and I um, came up with in uh, last year. And the way we did this is using a protocol that is uh, very, very well established in the, in the dual theory called the canonical purification. So this allows us to sharpen this puzzle. It allows us to remove the bath and work with very standard ADS CFT. So the way we do this, in the, so again, the canonical purification. So this is something that's going to come up a lot in this talk. We're going to make a lot of, a, a lot of uh, use of the canonical purification. So I'll just review what that looks like. So we take some density matrix. Typically we want, want, we want some mixed state and we want to purify in a way that is canonical, doesn't introduce any arbitrary new degrees of freedom um, or too arbitrary, something that feels very natural. So we take the, this density matrix row uh, in the diagonal basis, this row acts on some Hilbert space H, 
and we double the Hilbert space. We define a new pure state, typically called square root of rho, canonical purification of rho, which we just get by flipping the bras to cats and taking the square root um, of the eigenvalues here. If you trace out the new degrees of freedom that are introduced by this new Hilbert space you've added in, then you get the old state back. So it's a purification of rho. This is canonical purification in a sense that you're sort of just doubling the space to purify rho. The, we, we also understand that one, one thing I want to say is that we've all seen this before. This is just the, um, the protocol that we take to get from the Gibbs ensemble to the thermophile double. That's just a special case of the canonical purification. And the reason that the canonical purification is so useful for us in this context and throughout this talk is that it has a very well understood gravitational bulk dual. So we can do this in the CFT and we get a gravitational bulk dual that we understand. And the way we, we get the bulk dual is by CPT conjugating the bulk space time around the minimal quantum extremal surface. So this I already said, so yeah, just as a, as a comment that the Gibbs state can be obtained, you can get the thermophile double by canonically purifying the, um, the Gibbs ensemble. In ADS CFT, that gives us the maximally extended Schwarzschild ADS black hole. And that's again, that's a, that's a CPT conjugation of the entanglement wedge of one side that gives you the thermophile double, the entanglement wedge of the union. So this is this uh, this protocol here. This is the geometric protocol that we take some CFT and some mixed state rho. It has some semi-classical dual entanglement wedge. So that's the entanglement wedge. Some Cauchy slice sigma. We want to get the bulk dual to the canonical purification of rho. And the way we do this is we CPT conjugate the entanglement wedge around the quantum extremal surface chi. That gives us a complete Cauchy slice. And then we just evolve this backwards and forwards in time to generate a full space time. So this space time is the dual to the canonical purification of the state row, which is dual to this entanglement wedge. Okay, so now we can use this to formulate a sharper version of the puzzle that I mentioned earlier. So we're going to take our system B, again, B is the, the black hole, the lower dimensional CFT that's dual to the bulk in standard ADS CFT. We'll consider it at T1, which is before the page time, where the entanglement wedge of B is this entire blue region, which contains a complete bulk Cauchy slice. We are going to trace out the bath, and then we're going to decouple the two. So we trace out the bath, we decouple the two, and then we evolve backwards and forwards using reflecting bath conditions. So now we have just standard ADS boundary conditions, and we just get this space time here. And now we can canonically purify. So the canonical purification, again, is obtained by doing a CPT conjugation around the minimal quantum extremal surface. In this case, the quantum extremal surface is the empty set. So CPT conjugation just generates for us a CPT conjugated copy of the spacetime, meaning the dual to the canonical purification of B at time T1 is the union of these two disconnected spacetimes. So this is what happens at B. Again, we've traced out the bath. There's no question of what's going on at the boundary. There's standard reflecting boundary conditions. And this is the canonical purification of the black hole at time T1. Now let's consider B at time T2. Again, T1 and T2 are picked to have the same value of the von Neumann entropy. Well, now again, we trace out the bath. So we, have, we are just left with this WB here. And we put in reflecting boundary conditions, we turn off the coupling with reflecting boundary conditions, and then we canonically purify B. Well, now we have a non-trivial quantum extremal surface. When we CPT conjugate around this non-trivial quantum extremal surface, we actually generate a space-time that's connected, okay, where this quantum extremal surface here is bifurcating these two entanglement wedges. So the canonical purification of capital B at T2 is a classically connected space-time even though the Neumann entropy uh, at T2 and at T1 is the same by construction. So we have two semi-classical holographic spacetimes. Each of them has two asymptotic boundaries. They have the same value of the Neumann entropy. One of them is connected and the other is not connected. So we find that entanglement entropy does not always build spacetime, even when we have this semi-classical emergent geometry, you know, fluctuations are heavily suppressed, there's no stringy effects going on. 
the very sort of classical standard space times. But entanglement entropy does not build space time in this scenario. So what we'd like to understand is what is the relevant difference between these two states, the state at T1 and the state at T2, that gives us connectivity at T2 and does not give us connectivity at T1. So we have a puzzle we're going to have to solve if we want to understand space-time emergence and its relation to entanglement. So the goal is that we want to find a way to sharpen the ER equals EPR proposal so we can address these three points. First, we want to give a precise mathematical definition of classical connectivity and also a diagnostic in the dual CFT that can tell that this is classically connected. We also want to give a precise mathematical definition of quantum connectivity and the diagnostic in the dual CFT that can tell when two systems are quantum connected. And finally, we'd like to understand what happens at the page time that dramatically changes the connectivity properties of the black hole. Why is it that the black hole at T1 cannot be classically connected to anything, but the black hole at T2 is classically connected to its canonical purification, to the radiation? So the structure um, of this talk, as I mentioned before, first review of the counter example, which we just did. And now we're going to talk about the algebraic proposal for what builds space-time connectivity. And let me just briefly motivate why we go to algebras here. It's not just because they've appeared a lot recently, it's because there's we, we have been thinking and there's a general feeling that the more fine-grained properties and structure of entanglement might be the key to understanding what's actually in which cases you actually get space-time emergence and when you don't. And so looking for a way in which we can reformulate ER equals EPR in terms of em the emergence of certain types of algebras could shed light on how space-time connectivity is encoded in the dual theory. So a little bit of intuition here. We wanna talk about classical connectivity and quantum connectivity, and it really only makes sense to talk about a space-time being classically connected if the space-time is classical. It sounds silly and self-evident when I say it, but it has far-reaching implications. What we mean when we say that a space-time is classical, it means that nothing can diverge with G Newton in the G Newton goes to zero limit. So it means that classically, we, we're, we don't have fluctuations that survive the G Newton goes to zero limit. We don't have diffeomorphism invariants that, who, that scale with inverse powers of G Newton in the G Newton goes to zero limit. So this is our definition of a classical space-time. So we say that a, class, a space-time is classical when there exists a Cauchy slice of the space-time. And you can relax this to a time slice or you know, ADS Cauchy slice, depending on the geometry you want. There is a slice sigma on which the metric components in some basis are of order G Newton to the zero. The fluctuations of the metric components are suppressed in positive powers of G Newton. And all diffeomorphism invariants, such as volumes and areas, scale with non-negative powers of G Newton. So this is, this is important, this is crucial, crucial for us in order to have a notion of what we mean by classical connectivity. And what we mean by classical connectivity is that there are two asymptotic boundaries, R1 and R2 of some space-time M, and I'll talk about connectivity between subregions momentarily, but for now, let's just take two complete asymptotic boundaries. And we have a classical space-time. The space-time is classically connected if there's a continuous path from R1 to R2 on this Cauchy slice sigma. This was important that the space-time is classical because what does it really mean to have a continuous path if your metric is fluctuating? We don't really know of a good way to define that. So if we have, if we have areas or lengths that scale with in, inversely with G Newton, that's a path that, is it really connected? Its length is divergent and the G Newton goes to zero limit. We don't think that that really qualifies as classical connectivity. So this is what we mean. This is our definition of what we mean by classical connectivity. We mean pathwise connected through this Cauchy slice sigma. Now, there is another class of space times which are natural to discuss. So what if we don't satisfy the, the, this very rigid definition of a classical space time, but there's still some notion of an emergence in the classical geometry? So for example, if you look at space times that arise from these cross product constructions that have appeared recently, in some of Edward's papers and um, this paper by uh, Van and, and Jeff and friends, where you have a classical metric, you have the, the components of the metric are order G Newton to the zero, 
but you have large fluctuations. The fluctuations are suppressed in some parameter which scales as order G Newton to the zero. So this is what happens in these cross product constructions where you consider um, a microcanonical thermal field double and you try to, uh, and, and you have to, uh, you pick an energy band which is uh, which is which is essentially it's too special, it's too, too 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 narrow, and so you get large fluctuations in the conjugate variable, which is time, and that that means that you you are not quite satisfying the definition of a classical space time, but you're still a good notion of semi classical gravity in these space times. So we still might want to be able to have some notion of um, of semi of semi classicality of sub, of connectivity for these space times. Another example is the evaporating black hole. At times of order one over G Newton. So in those situations, the volume in JT gravity, the length of this of slices behind the horizon that diverges as with with, with the gene in the G Newton goes to zero limit. But the metric is not really is not fluctuating a lot, um, and the geometry sort of still exists. So again, we'd like to be able to talk about semi-classical emergent geometries in this case. And this, we give this these space times a name, they're not quite as well behaved as classical space times. But um, there's, they still, it still makes sense to talk about them and have some notion of connectivity for them. So these are space times we call quantum volatile. So a space time is quantum volatile if whenever you have a Cauchy slice where the metric components are order g n to the zero, um, in other words, a Cauchy slice that would be a candidate for the definition of a classical space time, either you have fluctuations of the metric, which are suppressed, but with some parameter that's order g newton to the zero, so not not order G Newton to some positive power, or you have diffeomorphism invariants that scale with negative powers of G Newton, or, or you could have both. So this is what we call a quantum volatile spacetime. And it really only makes sense to talk about two quantum volatile spacetimes being connected or a quantum volatile spacetime being connected if we are talking about quantum connectivity. So this will allow us to give a definition of quantum connectivity. Quantum volatile space times can only be quantum connected. You cannot define classical connectivity for anything other than a classical space time. Okay, so now we've been given some definitions. We are going to take on the task of understanding, of giving a quantitative algebraic version of error equals EPR. So let's get a bit of intuition for classical connectivity. What should be the criterion, the algebraic criterion for classical connectivity? So if the space time is classically connected, what do we have? Well, here's the thermal field double, our favorite uh, example of a connected uh, ge emergent geometry. And we have R1 and R2. The if the space time is classically connected, then the entanglement wedges of R1 and R2 will share a common non-trivial edge, the quantum extremal surface. And so we can translate that into a statement about the bulk quantum fields. So the bulk Fox space of low energy perturbations around this geometry it shouldn't contain states that can factorize into a product state on these two entanglement wedges. We shouldn't be able to have that without large back reaction. And we're only talking about the Fox space of low energy perturbations. So in this Fox space, we shouldn't be able to have factorized states. The boundary way of saying this is that the GNS Hilbert space that we construct from this state that the pure state dual to this full geometry should fail to factorize into HR1 and HR2. What that means intuitively is that the algebra of operators where we don't include cross product improvements because those make the space time not classical. So the algebra of operators in the large n limit should qualitatively be similar to the algebra of operators in Rindler space. So the expectation is that it should be type 3, 1. Where, well, what do we expect then from a disconnected geometry, one that's very obviously disconnected? So here are two pure ADS space times. Maybe there's some small amount of entanglement between the quantum fields here and the quantum fields there. Well, we think that a disconnected classical space times should sort of fail these criteria that I just described. The, the algebra of bulk operators should be type one. And why do I say that? I say that because when you have a disconnected classical space time, you expect to be able to put a pure state on a factorized pure state on each one of these without actually incurring large back reaction. So the because we have this, uh, this ability, 
thanks to recent developments and not so recent developments, to translate statements about bulk algebras into boundary algebras. That means that we can talk about the algebra of boundary operators and the type of the algebra of boundary operators using these statements about the algebra of bulk operators. So in the disconnected case, we might expect that the algebra of, of the boundary operators is type one, but in the connected case, we expect that the algebra of operators acting on the GNS Hilbert space in the large n limit should be type three one. So I've given you some intuition. What's the more general uh, framework here? Well, the, the intuition is really boils down to the idea that connectivity of bulk space times in this G Newton goes to zero limit is related to lack of factorizability. So the failure of factorizability without incurring large back reaction. So we expect that the space time is going to be disconnected if and only if the corresponding boundary algebras are type one. And so that's, that's just a general expectation. Now, when the space time is strictly classical, it has this, this nice properties that there are no large fluctuations and there are diffeomorphism invariants don't scale with inverse powers of G Newton, then we expect that we have the, just standard local quantum field theory in the bulk. And so if we have an edge in the bulk that we're looking essentially at a Rindler type situation, which translates into a type three one bulk subalgebra and by subalgebra subregion duality that translates into a type three one boundary subalgebra when the bulk is classically connected. And finally, if you have a quantum volatile spacetime, we run into this issue that I mentioned earlier. There's no independent notion of quantum connectivity. And so what we do is we give a notion of quantum connectivity. We define it using the emergent subalgebras. If the boundary subalgebras of the two boundaries, AR1 and AR2, fail to be type 1, then we say the spacetime is quantum connected. Because they're, if they're type 1, then you can put a factorized state. If they're not type 1, then there's something preventing you from doing that, which we interpret as quantum connectivity. So the formal statement of our proposal of algebraic ER equals EPR is the following. So we've given some bipartite pure state. And again, I'll say more about the multipartite case later. But if we're given some bipartite pure state, psi R1, R2, with an emergent semi-classical, by semi-classical, I mean either classical or quantum volatile, bulk dual, then we have the following criteria. R1 and R2 are classically connected through the bulk if and only if the entanglement wedge of R1 union R2 is classical and the boundary subalgebras are type 3, 1. The same regions, this, the, the two asymptotic boundaries, R1 and R2, are quantum connected if the entanglement wedge is quantum volatile and the algebras are not type 1. And finally, these two boundaries, R1 and R2, are disconnected if the boundary algebras are type 1. Now, you might note here that I said if and only if here, and if here, and if here. So the reason I say if and only if here is that we have an independent definition of classical connectivity, and we can prove that it's equivalent to this. Here, this is in some sense the definition of quantum connectivity, and this is our definition of disconnectivity, both for quantum and the classical case. So because these are definitions, we did not put if and only if there. OK. Now, I mentioned that this can be generalized to, um, to subregions. So let me say a little bit about generalizing this to subregions. Because it's not just interesting to know when two asymptotic boundaries are connected. Sometimes we'd like to know when two subregions of the same asymptotic boundary are connected, or when two subregions of two different asymptotic boundaries are connected. Or maybe we have a space time which has four asymptotic boundaries, and we'd like to know which ones are connected. And there it seems that the algebra is going to be type 3, 1 in some sense, no matter what. So in particular for subregions. So let's just take a take a look at pure ADS here. We take the pure ADS, we take two subregions, R1 and R2. And we say, all right, what this is a classical space time, no complications. And we say in this case, when, the, when R1 and R2 are small, the entanglement wedge is this gray region and it's disconnected. And when R1 and R2 are large enough, we have a phase transition and now the entanglement wedge is connected. But no matter what, the algebra of, of operators is type 3, 1, because we have this edge in the bulk, which cuts through, uh, which sort of the surface that cuts through the bulk, which essentially serves like a Rindler horizon. 
and gives us a type 3, 1 algebra, both in the disconnected case and in the connected case. So naively, it appears that our proposal just doesn't work. It only works when you have a bipartite pure state, which is good, but somewhat limiting. And as I mentioned before, we might also be interested in multipartite states on multiple asymptotic boundaries. So here we have a four boundary wormhole. This is a moment of time slice of a four boundary wormhole where all four boundaries are connected. And here we have a moment of time slice of, a two, of, of two, two boundary wormholes where R1 is connected to R4 and R2 is connected to R3. If we ask, is R1 connected to R2 here? And we use the criterion of an emergent type 3, 1 von Neumann algebra. Then we say, yes, they are connected. There's an emergent type, th type 3, 1 von Neumann algebra for the entanglement wedge, where the entanglement wedge will be cut off by a surface basically around here. And if we ask, well, what's the emergent algebra over here? Well, R1 is going to have a surface over here that cuts it off. So this is going to be, R1 is going to be type 3, 1, and R2 will also be type 3, 1. So we're going to find that no matter which one of these we have, the relevant algebras of operators, AR1 and AR2, are still going to be type 3, 1. So again, it seems that we just can't distinguish using this criterion. So maybe we're back to step one as far as multipartite states go. Uh, fortunately, that's not the case. We do actually have a fairly simple way of handling multipartite states as well. And this is where the canonical purification comes in again. So we're given some mixed state, psi R1, R2. So it's a multipartite state on an some n parties, but it's a mixed state on two, psi R1, R2. Now, we can canonically purify psi R1, R2 into a state on R1, R2, plus these two copies, these copies of R1 and a copy of R2. So the canonical purification always returns a pure state, which means that we now have a four-party pure state. And a four-party pure state can be repartitioned into a, a bipartite state on unions of the two parties. So we have a bipartite state on R1, R1 tilde, which is the new copy that we introduced by canonically purifying, and R2, R2 tilde. Again, R2 is the new copy of R2 that we introduced by canonically purifying on R1, R2. And the proposal, the protocol, is the following. If the algebra of boundary operators on R1, R1 tilde is type 3, 1, and the space times classical, then the entanglement wedge of R1, R1 tilde is classically connected to the entanglement wedge of R2, R2 tilde. I'll have pictures in a second. So here we are. So we have R1, R2. In this case, R1 and R2 are disconnected. To diagnose this quantity, this, this property from the boundary, what we do is we say, all right, let's canonically purify psi R1, R2. That means CPT conjugating around the dominant quantum extremal surface, which generates for us this space time. R1, R1 tilde is a complete Cauchy slice. Uh, give, the entanglement wedge of R1, R tilde has a complete Cauchy slice of the bulk. The entanglement wedge of R2, R2 tilde also has a complete Cauchy slice of the bulk. And indeed, we find that A, R1, R1 tilde is type 1, not type 3, 1. And by this proposal here, that tells us that it's disconnected. On the other hand, up here, we can do the same thing again. We canonically purify R1, R2. And that gives us this funny geometry here where if we look at the algebra of operators of R1, R1 tilde, it's going to have this interior space-time boundary. And that algebra will be type 3, 1, which tells us that in the original space-time, R1 and R2 are connected. So this, the algebra of R1, of Ri union, it's canonical, the, the, the copy we get from the canonical purification is type 3, 1, if and only if we have a classical space-time and R1 was connected to R2 in the original space time. So we do have a way of handling these multi-partite geometries by having this provision that first we canonically purify before we, anal we analyze the properties of the, um, of, of the regions and the connectivity. So here's a, here are a couple of examples where we have a full, uh, full boundaries. So multi-partite states with more than one, with, with multiple boundaries. So here we have some multipartite state with many asymptotic boundaries. And we're interested in asking whether R1 and R2 are connected. So the way we do this is we canonically purify psi R1, R2. And that generates for us this space time over here. 
And then we ask, what's the algebra of operators on R1, R1 tilde? Well, we have this interior space-time boundary here, which, uh, which tells us that this is Rindler-like, which gives us a type 3, 1 von Neumann algebra in the bulk, which gives us a type 3, 1 von Neumann algebra in the boundary. And we say, ah, A, R1, R1 tilde is type 3, 1. Ergo, R1 is connected to R2. Indeed, they are connected. We instead consider R1 and R2 separately. So here, they, they, these are connected to some other asymptotic boundaries, but not to each other. And we canonically purify. Now the algebra of operators of R1, R1 tilde is type 1. And so we say, ah, that means that in the original space-time, R1 and R2 were disconnected. And indeed, this is the case over here. And finally, over here, we have just this very, this is, this is a situation where, again, R1 is connected to something else. R2 is connected to something else. We canonically purify, and we find this is type 1. They're not connected to each other. OK, so this is the proposal, the formal proposal. Given a mixed state, psi R1 or R2, with a semi-classical bulk dual, I'm using the word semi-classical as an inclusive term of both classical and quantum volatile, then we have the following e algebraic ER equals EPR proposal. So there's an emergent semi-classical -class connectivity from R1 to R2. If the entanglement wedge is classical, so we have the right to talk about classical connectivity, and the algebra of operators of R1, R1, R1 tilde, R2, R2 tilde, each of these is type 3, 1. We have quantum connectivity between R1 and R2. If the entanglement wedge is quantum volatile, and these two algebras are not type 1. And finally, they are disconnected if these two algebras are type 1. So this is the proposal for diagnosing connectivity in a multipartite mixed state case. Now, we started all this with a discussion of the evaporating black hole and the Fani Connery example that we get by canonically purifying the black hole. So what happens in this case? So here we are. We have the entanglement wedge of the black hole before the page time at this time T1, which is order one over G Newton, but pre-page. And we have this funny thing where if we don't decouple the black hole from the reservoir, we're going to have a type 3, 1 von Neumann algebra because of entanglement across the interface. But our proposal is always for reflecting boundary conditions. We don't deal with non-standard boundary conditions in this proposal. Maybe that's fodder for future work. And the counter example that I discussed specifically requires us to have to impose reflecting boundary conditions and trace out the bath. OK. So we're going to decouple the bath. If all backwards and forwards with the decoupled Hamiltonian, we get this entanglement wedge here. And we have a Cauchy slice of the entanglement wedge, which is a complete slice of the bulk, as we've talked about before. But when we look at this, we say, OK, well, we have a von Neumann entropy. We look at the von Neumann entropy of the system B on this, you know, we evaluate at this time. We know this entropy is order one over G Newton, which diverges and the G Newton goes to zero limit. And we can we can argue essentially using the intuition that um, you you can't get pure states on this uh, we can't you cannot put a pure state on this system because the von Neumann entropy is divergent in the G Newton goes to zero limit. You can make this a little bit more precise. Um, so it's not type one. So whatever this geometry is, it's connected in some way or another to its purification. So either classically connected or it's quantum connected to the canonical purification or to essentially any purification with a geometric dual. Okay, so here again is this picture where we canonically purify. So take this at, for the page time, trace out the bath, reflecting boundary conditions that canonically purify, we have this. And here we have this connected space time. Now, what's interesting about the black hole before the page time, at time order one of a G Newton, is that the volume, the length of the bridge is divergent in the G Newton goes to zero limit, as I mentioned before. So this space time is quantum volatile, which means since it's not, the algebra is not type one, it's in fact quantum connected. So we find that the canonical purification of the black hole before the page time is quantum connected. And after the page time, this is a classical space time. And the canonical purification of the black hole is classically connected to the black hole. So there's a, a sort of a nice timeline here, where at very early times, we have the before the entropy is a, diverges with G Newton, the algebra is type one. So the evaporating black hole 
is disconnected from its canonical purification, or from really from any purification. They start out disconnected. Then as we evolve closer to the page time, they become quantum connected. And eventually we evolve past the page time, they end up classically connected. And so there's a, this natural phase, connectivity phases that we go through in the evaporating black hole from the beginning um, through to the late stages of the evaporation process. Okay. So let me see how much time I've left, Get a little bit of time. Um, so this addresses points one and two of understanding what we mean by classical connectivity, diagnosing classical connectivity, understanding what we mean by quantum connectivity, defining what we mean by quantum connectivity and diagnosing it. But we also would like to understand this third point. What happens at the page time that shifts so dramatically and changes the connectivity properties of the black hole? So something dramatic changes before it's it's quantum connected before the page time, it's classically connected after the page time. What changed? A lot of things changed from before the page time to after the page time, which is the salient one. So this brings us to the final part of this talk, which is the discussion of a transfer of a high complexity algebra of operators. So in geometric terms, what really happens is that we have this island, the black, which is essentially all of the black hole interior, and it transfers from being part of the black hole system, part of the dual to B, to being part of the radiation system, part of the dual to R. In other words, we can think of this as saying, now the island can be reconstructed from the radiation. The black hole interior can be reconstructed from the radiation. Now, we also know uh, there's quite a few uh, pieces of evidence for this at this point, but the earliest one is from Harlow Hayden, where um, we understand that the reconstruction of the interior from the radiation is exponentially complex in the entropy of the black hole. And again, the, the goal here is to try to identify the relevance of algebras that uh, identify an algebraic understanding of this transition at the page time. So again, geometrically, we understand this is a transfer of a geometric region from one subsystem to another. How do we identify that in, you know, in, in boundary language? And so the holographic realization of this, um, of, of how do we, of the reconstruction of the island, how we construct it, how we identifying it, is a so-called strong Python's launch proposal. So this is, um, this is I like to call complexity coarse graining, multiple names for the same thing, really which is uh, the following two points. So first, the region outside of a, of a non-minimal quantum extremal surface, the outermost non-minimal quantum extremal surface, admits a simple reconstruction in the boundary theory. So operators that are localized outside of the minimal quantum extremal, of the non-minimal quantum extremal surface, admit a sub-exponentially complex reconstruction, sub-exponential sub -exponential in, the, in, in the entropy of the black hole. And the region behind the non-minimal quantum extremal surface, in this case, the region inside, which is the island, is exponentially hard to reconstruct in the bessie hawking entry. Now, what we'd like to do is rewrite this algebraically. So we need to identify the relevance of algebras for the story. So here's the outermost quantum extremal surface, the one that's relevant for the story of complexity coarse graining, the one that splits us up between operators that are simple to reconstruct, operators that are high, highly complex to reconstruct. So this is the outermost quantum extremal surface, and it divides our space-time, it, it divides part of our space-time into two wedges. This is O hat, that's the wedge where we can do a simple reconstruction, a sub-exponentially complex reconstruction, and this I hat is the interior, so O stands for outer, I stands for inner. Um, this I hat, is the wedge which is consists of high complexity operators. And so in the G Newton goes to zero limit, we're going to have a decomposition of the bulk algebra of operators whenever we have this outermost quantum extremal surface, which will be the algebra of operators in O hat, and we'll have the algebra of operators in I hat, and the algebra of operators in the entanglement wedge will be generated by this union. Now, what we'd like to understand is what are these algebras in the boundary theory? That's what will allow us to write an algebraic criterion for what happens at the page time that dramatically changes the properties of the black hole and takes it from being quantum connected to its purification to being classically connected to its purification. Well, we know that the algebra of the operators in O hat maps to simple operators 
So this is the algebra of simple operators. And this is only an algebra in the large n limit, but it is an algebra in the large n limit. This was shown by um, Hong and Sam a while ago. And you can think of simple operators really as just finite products um, of single trace operators. When I say finite, I mean finite in the G Newton goes to zero limit. And we know that for certain states, this is not all there is. In cer for certain states, so this, this limit is um, a state dependent limit. And for certain states, we have other operators that are not described in this way. So for example, for the evaporating black hole, operators that reconstruct the radiation are high complexity. They are not finite products of single trace operators. And so we have this other algebra of operators, a i hat, which, map, which maps to the algebra of high complexity operators that act on the GNS Hilbert space. We call this a sub c. So this, this is in the bulk. It's just the bulk operators. This is what it maps to on the boundary. So now working in the bulk, we can say, OK, the, we can talk about the reservoir in the Hawking state. So this is the state that doesn't isn't able to reconstruct anything that thinks that unitarity is violated. And if you just look at simple operators in the bulk, then that's the state you think you have, because you can't reconstruct the island just using simple operators. So the reservoir. That's the simple operators, that's O hat. The island is what you can get if you have access to high complexity operators, that's I hat. So this is the complex factor, I hat, and the O hat is always this orange wedge over here. And so the page time is really a transition of a high complexity type three one factor that goes from B to R. We have complexity transfer from B to R. And that is really what happens at the page time. Now, I'm running a little short on time, so I'm going to skip through the canonical purification of the island here and just talk briefly about this as applied to phase transitions more generally. So what, what we've just discussed is that this change from having a, a, a an empty set for an, a dominant quantum extremal surface, which is the reason that the pre-page black hole cannot be classically connected to anything, it's quantum connected to its purification, but not classically connected. The reason is there's an empty set quantum extremal surface. And after the page time, we have a non-trivial quantum extremal surface. This is a consequence of a, of a switchover in the dominant quantum extremal surface. And the microscopic mechanism responsible for this is a transfer of a type 3-1 high complexity algebra in the boundary. And we can actually interpret the transition between a subdominant quantum extremal surface becoming dominant more generally as a transfer of this complex of this type 3 1 factor from one subsystem to another. So, for example, in the two boundary case, in, in, the, in the two subregion cases, R1 and R2 over here, when we make R1 and R2 progressively bigger, eventually there's a switchover in the dominant quantum extremal surface. We go from having this one be the dominant one to having this one be the dominant one. And what happens is, in this case, the high complexity algebra, that's operators that live here, they belong to the complement. And when we make this progressively larger, eventually what happens is this type 3, 1 factor, which is not geometric on the boundary. On the boundary, it's just some, we don't know how to identify it other than in terms of complexity. That one is emergent. Um, it, sorry, that, that one shifts from the complement of R1 union R2 to R1 union R2. So. I would like to advertise this as a fundamental mechanism that's responsible for the phase transition as a constant that comes as a consequence of a switchover in a quantum extremal surface. Okay, so a few comments. What we have here is an algebraic reformulation of ER equals EPR that gives us a definition of what we mean by quantum connectivity. It allows us to understand why the black hole before the page time and after the page time appears to have a connectivity puzzle. And it allows us to make progress on identifying what we mean by emergent space-time, classical or quantum volatile. We give a formulation of this proposal for subregions and multipartite states, which will hopefully help us understand better what multipartite entanglement has to do with space-time emergence. And we also give a we also identify this high complexity type 3-1 factor, which is emergent in a large n limit. And can't be thought of as a sort of a, a, an algebra localized to a subregion on the boundary. But this 
is useful and critical for understanding what happens microscopically in the black hole before and after the page time and also connectivity between the island and the radiation for, uh, for understanding those in the language of the CFT and understanding those microscopically. And indeed, this is actually more general, not just the evaporating black hole, but we can use this to understand microscopically the change, the switchover in quantum extremal surfaces. So um, with that, thank you very much for your attention, and I'll be happy to take uh, any and all questions. It's any order one fraction before the page time. Um, so it's really as soon as you get to order one of to times of order one over G that you um, that you start seeing this. So scrambling time is not enough, but you need order one over G. Yeah, so so that's part of our refinement. Yeah, that's part of the refinement here. So I would say I would not agree that connectivity is a topological thing, although topologists certainly have a definition of, of, uh, of connectivity. I would say that if we want to talk about emergent space time, we're always talking about an emergent geometry. And so that means that we the, the notion that is meaningful for us is a geometric connectivity. So in particular, that means that this whole story about the bridge to nowhere is important because if you, you could say, oh, I have a, an infinite length path, um, infinite um, vacuum subtracted length path between R1 and R2. Is it classically connected? Well, I would say for all intents and purposes, geometrically, no, it's not. Um, and although topologically it, it, it is. So I think that the topological definition is one that you could use if you wanted to, but I don't think it's particularly useful for us as far as understanding space-time emergence. Mm -hmm. Ah. Yeah, so so we yeah, we require that there exists a basis, a coordinate system on a Cauchy slice in which the components of the metric are ordered G Newton to the zero and the comp and the, they do not do not fluctuate with negative with, with and it, any fluctuations are suppressed with positive powers of G Newton. So we don't talk we don't fix a gauge, we just require that there exists a gauge where this is true. Um, so I would say that space-time is classical, not because the region near the singularity is classical. In fact, I would say it's not, but because for classical connectivity, we only demand that there exists a Cauchy slice on which this is satisfied, rather than that it's true for all Cauchy slices. No, 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 no. Sorry, sorry. I, I, if, if I said that, I misspoke. Um, we have a, we don't have an independent definition of disconnected if we also include quantum disconnected in that. Um, because in the absence of a definition of quantum connected, we don't have a definition of quantum disconnected.
Um, so I think, so for the canonically purified um, pre-page black hole, I would have put it at disconnected before this characterization. I would have just said that this is a disconnected space-time, which was very confusing because you actually can't put pure states on it. So with the characterization of quantum connectivity and quantum volatile space-times, we actually are able to say this space-time is, that the reason it's confusing, the reason it appears to violate multiple conjectures and proposals is because it's quantum volatile and quantum connected to its purification. So this is an example of something we didn't understand that we now do understand with this new formalism. Now, we, we could talk about what, it, what happens in, this, in the cross-product constructions and with, you know, what, what, what do we mean by an emergent space-time in those cases. I think that the crux here is finding more examples of space-times that are quantum volatile. And so far, we have just a couple of examples. And we can also talk about, um, we can talk about JT at finite G-Newton, but most of our constructions here rely pretty heavily on taking the G-Newton goes to zero limit. So that's, uh, that's something that we're, we're thinking about. Um, and, and you know there, there are other constructions that we're thinking about about as far as uh, quantum connectivity goes. And I think that this proposal is going to have sort of the most power when it comes to diagnosing quantum connectivity for space times that at least a priori look disconnected. No. Oh, sure. Sorry, sorry. I misunderstood you. Yeah, I misunderstood you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So the, the, the crux here is that we're talking about a type 3-1, um, well, not the type, it doesn't actually matter. We're, what we're talking about here is the algebra of operators that acts on the GNS Hilbert space in the larger n limit, and that makes it state dependent. And so when we're talking about the algebra for, let me actually go back here. When we're talking about the algebra of operators on psi R1, R2, we're talking about this particular subalgebra that's the operators acting in the GNS Hilbert space on psi, constructed from psi R1, R2, that's different from what we get by acting, by, by doing the same construction on psi R1, R2 here, because the state has changed and this is a state dependent construction. So you're right that if we just look at the full algebra of all operators, then, and we just look at you know the, the operators that act on R1, R2 in the full algebra, then yeah, that, that's very puzzling. But here we're constructing a subalgebra that in a state-dependent way. And so as the state changes, we're talking about different subregions, so will the algebra. That's right, yeah. Um, in the context of, oh, sorry, you said ADS BCFT? Oh, DSFT. Um, that's a, it's an excellent question. Um, we have not thought about DSCFT very much at this point. Um, it's, it's challenging because we understand the relation, the algebraic relations between the bulk and boundary much more precisely in the context of AD, and generally in the context of ADS CFT. Um, that said, assuming there is some fundamental description of quantum gravity in the sitter, I would hope that some of these lessons would indeed carry over.
two copies. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Two copies, something like that. Yeah. 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 I, I think, I mean, I should say I'm told I'm speculating when it comes to the sitter. I haven't thought too hard about this when it comes to the sitter, 